Today, in this episode of Engine Week, we traveled out to Lockwood Aviation in Sebring, Florida to talk about Rotax aircraft engines. All the details coming up right now. All right, so I'm here with Dean here at Lockwood, and he's going to talk Rotax this morning with us. Good morning, experimenters. I'm here with Brian. Uh, as he said, my name is Dean Vogel. Uh, we're at uh, Lockwood Aviation in Sebring, Florida. Uh, Lockwood Aviation specializes in the Rotax aircraft engines and service uh, pretty much any aircraft that operate with this kind of power. Uh, so we're going to be talking this morning a little bit about the different engines, a little bit of the history behind uh, when the engines came out uh, from Rotax and uh, how they're being applied in aviation. Uh, the engines started off with the 80 horse engine in about 1988. Um, that would have been the 912 UL. You can recognize that with the black valve covers on the side of the engine. Uh, it was a 1211cc engine, 9 to 1 compression ratio, uh, and they were learning a lot, and so was the aviation community there in the first few years uh, that that engine was operating. In the mid-90s, they went to a turbocharged version of that engine, that's called the 914. You would recognize that by seeing the red valve covers on the engine and a turbocharger, of course, underneath. Uh, that one was boosted at sea level, so that one would be getting 115 horsepower and internally that was the same engine as what the 912 UL was. Uh, then a little bit after that in the mid 90's they wanted to go to a little higher horsepower without the complexity of the turbocharging so what they did is they came out with the 912 ULS or the S for the certified version that one you can recognize by seeing the jade green valve covers on the side of the engine. So. What they did to, to get that was they went to a little bit larger bore on the engine, so it's now a 1352cc engine instead of 1211. They went to a 10.8 to 1 compression ratio, a few other little tweaks on the engine, and got 100 horsepower then instead of the 80 horsepower. Uh, that was the staple of the light sport market for a lot of years after that. Uh, and then in 2012, they used some of the technology that they learned in working on fuel-injected engines, uh, and they came out with a 912 IS for the uh, injected version of the engine. It's the same internal geometry as the 912 ULS, so it has the, the 100 horsepower, um, but that's about where the similarity ends. Uh, the, all the induction system, all the fuel delivery system, all the ignition, all the power generation is completely different on the engine and a few other subtle differences yet besides. Um, since 2012 this engine has uh, pretty much taken the market by storm. There are light sport manufacturers that I talked with that said once they had an installation worked out for this engine they couldn't sell another carbureted engine. Um, I'll I'll tattle a little bit on Dick Van Grunsman. He was resistant to the idea of doing anything but a ULS for several years, but once he saw the performance of this engine on the RV-12, he would just as soon not sell a carbureted engine anymore after that. Um, so then, uh, this has been very, very successful. A lot of people are very happy with it, uh, especially because of the changes in the maintenance between this one and the, and the ULS. Um, Obviously, no normal carburetor maintenance needs to be done on the engine. Um, what, what are some of the other advantages from the 912 carbureted to the 912 in, injection? It, it, is it easier to start the, more fuel efficient? Or? The, the, about the only advantage that you're going to see on the ULS over the IS is the fact that it's about 14 pounds lighter. Hey everyone, let me take just a moment here to thank our sponsors that make all this possible. Great companies like Airworks, Airtech Coatings, Clemens Insurance Agency, Acme Aero, Stoll Creek Aviation, InFlight Cam, Wheelin Aerospace Technologies. So take a moment after this video to say hello to all of them and remember to check out the affiliate links in the description below. And remember, just build it. Let's get back to it. Okay, now conversely, the fuel injected engine is more efficient fuel wise. So if you're on a cross country cruise, by the time you've cruised for three hours, you just burn that much less fuel with the injected engine than the carbureted engine. So you've made up that difference of 14 pounds. Um, 
and then uh, one of the advantages maintenance wise on the carbureted engine is that uh, it, it, don't have space in this video to go into all the detail, but there's a little bit less maintenance on the gearbox for the carbureted engine than there is for the injected engine. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have an airplane that's sitting around a lot, um, the fuel tends to go bad in carburetors fairly quickly, uh, so there are things you need to do to prepare the engine if you know it's going to be sitting for three weeks or more, especially if it's three months or more at a time without flying, whereas with an injected engine you just don't worry about that stuff. Um, so it, 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 a lot of people for that kind of reason are really happy with the injected engine. The injected engine is smoother than the carbureted engine uh, because it's run by a, com a computer. Uh, so it's a little bit easier on your airplane as well. Um, once they came out with the Sport, and there's some history behind that, but the Sport model, the 912 IS, is actually a little bit stronger on the torque curve in the 5,500 RPM range than the carbureted engine is. Uh, so takeoff performance is a little better when you have a fixed pitch propeller. Um, then about three years ago, Rotax came out with the 915 IS, uh, which is basically a turbocharged version of this engine. Um, they dropped the compression ratio down from 10.8 to 1 to about 9.2 to 1 because of the, the boosting at sea level. Uh, the 915 IS uh, is rated at 141 horsepower for takeoff. 135 horsepower continuous and that 141 horsepower is available all the way to about 16,000 feet uh, and the engine is certified set up uh, to be able to operate as high as flight level 230. Um, so that engine is starting to kind of come up out of the light sport category and into the bottom end of the experimental aircraft category. Uh, some of the challenges that people are seeing in, in adopting that engine there is that uh, it would replace like a Lycoming IO 320 or 360. Uh, it's significantly and, lighter. And, I'm sorry? It's significantly lighter than those. It, it, right, that's the, that's the challenge. Um, it, 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 it suits well to replace those engines because by the time you hit like 6,500 feet or, six, or 8,500 feet, the 915 is actually putting out more horsepower than those naturally aspirated light combings are. So application-wise, it works out well. The problem is the engine is so much lighter that now you've got CG issues when you're trying to adapt an airplane to that power plane. Uh, but other than that, the people that have been operating the 915 are very, very happy with it, thrilled with the performance, uh, and it's been going really well. And it's a new enough engine, we're still learning things about it, um, but uh, it, it holds great promise. And how are these engines cooled, or how many ways are these engines cooled? Uh, the engines, okay, for those aren't, that aren't that familiar with the, the Rotax itself, uh, the heads on these engines are liquid-cooled, the cylinders are air-cooled, uh, and then of course there's an air cooler for the, for the, uh, the oil as well. Uh, so basically there are three different ways uh, that the engines are cooled. Um, Speaking of cooling, uh, one item that we didn't mention as far as differences between the carbureted engine and the fuel injected engine is that the, the electrical power from the stator uh, on the carbureted engine is on the outside of the engine and on the injected engines they actually pulled it to the inside of the ignition housing on the engine because they wanted to run enough amperage through the stator uh, to generate electrical power uh, that they actually had to be able to spray oil on it to keep it cool. Uh, so the oil cooling on, on this engine is actually cooling the stator as well. So what is the, uh, the recommended rebuild or TBO on these engines and then what kind of maintenance would you expect along the way to make it to the TBO rating? Okay, the, the TBO on most all the engines is 2,000 hours and uh, we've been seeing that with great confidence. Um, the TBO at this point on the 915 is 1,200 hours. Basically the goal is to get to 2,000 hours with that one, but we're pulling enough horsepower out of that one that they're being conservative with it until we get some of the fleet leaders coming back at 1,200 hours and start examining how uh, that engine is doing before they would be able to start extending the TBO. As far as maintenance goes, um, from zero to 2,000 hours, uh, it varies of course according to engine. Uh, most of the maintenance on the injected engine just has to do with downloading the data at the 100 hour condition inspections. Uh, at 600 hours, uh, the gearbox comes off uh, to get an inspection. 
uh, and that would have to be sent into a heavy maintenance repair facility uh, for that inspection. But for the injecting engines, that's pretty much it. Spark plugs, oil filters, um, and, it, and the, uh, the changing of those components depends upon what fuel that you're using. Uh, if you're using an unleaded fuel, uh, then it's basically 100 hours for uh, oil and filter. And the, with the new Rotax spark plugs, it's like 400 hours for those as well. Uh, is there still a hose and rubber suggested replacement, or is that just on the carbureted and earlier models? Actually, the, the five-year, on all the engines, there are five-year components that need to be changed. Uh, it varies from engine to engine. Um, coolant lines, basically, on almost all of them, yeah, the coolant lines get changed every five years, for instance. All the oil lines, which would be, uh, there are no oil lines that come with the engine, so that would be something that is part of the aircraft installation, and those would be changed every five years. Um, yeah, there's not a whole lot else. On the fuel-injected engine, there are some hoses in the, in the fuel pump pack. Those would need to be changed every five years. Uh, the 915, the coolant lines are a some silicone type of line that I'm not real familiar with, but I do know that Rotax considers those now to be on condition, so those do not have to be changed every five years. Um, but yeah, the, a five-year event is a significant one in changing some of the components on any of the models of the engines at all. Okay. Um, and understand that you know, with any aircraft engine, there is some type of redundancy usually what is kind of inherent or built into these designs for that? Okay, on the carbureted engines, uh, the big redundancy there is in the ignition system. Um, there are two separate power supplies for the ignition system, uh, and you've got dual, parallel, identical, uh, solid state ignition systems on the carbureted engines. So they've been very, very reliable. Um, on the injected engine, You've got two different coils on the stator that I was talking about earlier, uh, and the and the, there's a, a box that comes with this engine called the fuse box. Uh, it has two regulator rectifiers on it, and that fuse box uh, can use either one of those regulator rectifiers for powering what's called the engine management system, or the EMS. Um, Normally it will use regulator A for doing that. If regulator A were to fail for some reason, uh, it would take regulator B and use that to run the EMS. Normally regulator B runs the airplane, charges the battery, runs the appliances, uh, radios, etc. Um, but if the fuse box needs to use that to run the EMS, then it takes regulator B away from the airplane, and then all your stuff on the airplane is just on battery power. How long is that going to last? Well, it depends upon the volume of the battery and how good you are at shedding the load. Uh, so that's kind of the redundancy there. Um, if you were to lose both your regulators, uh, the airplane is to be set up in such a way that you can throw a switch and you can actually run the EMS off of the battery for a period of time. Uh, if you wanted even more redundancy than that, you could, it could mount an auxiliary alternator either on the side of the gearbox or on the back of the gearbox. Uh, so once you had the engine running in that mode, you could do that indefinitely as well. Depends upon how many layer, layers of uh, redundancy you want to carry with you. Um, as far as maintenance goes, uh, what would the personal owner likely do on it and what should be or what has to be done at either a dealer or at the manufacturer level throughout the, the lifespan of these engines? The, the who of the maintenance on the engines is entirely dependent upon how much training. Uh, that you've got. Um, we do training here at Lockwood uh, on a regular basis, uh, multiple times a year. Uh, there's a service level of training uh, which introduces someone to, okay, what's it like to do a 100-hour condition inspection, oil and filter changes, spark plug changes, uh, some of those sorts of things, compression checks. Um, and then we've got a maintenance level of training which goes a little bit farther into it, like a 200-hour disassembly on the carburetors if you have a carbureted engine. Um, and goes into removing components from the engine. So, for instance, uh, if, you, if you came up on a time when you needed to have a gearbox inspection, the maintenance level training qualifies you for removing that, sending it into a heavy maintenance repair facility, and then when you get it back, you're qualified to get it back on and, and get the engine up and running again. So, really, as far as how that maintenance happens, it depends upon the training. Uh, we do emphasize the training a lot uh, in, in the Rotax community. 
um, mainly because these engines have a lot more in common with, say, motorcycle technology than they do with traditional aircraft technology. It doesn't make them any better or worse, uh, it just makes them radically different. And so people that have grown up in that Lycoming continental world, um, it, it, these engines become a mystery to them just because of a lot of the details. They're not a difficult engine to work with, uh, but there are some gotchas. And uh, unless you've been to the training, you won't know what those gotchas are and how to avoid them and the things that the engine needs to see to, say, to uh, stay healthy. The most popular questions about engines are the true horsepower output versus a rating, and then also the true weights and what is included or not included in weights. So where is a real accurate way of getting that information for builders and for people flying? Okay, we, we talked a little bit about the horsepower already. The, the 912 UL is 80 horsepower, and that's a pretty honest 80 horsepower. Now, you're not going to be running at 100% all the time. Uh, max continuous uh, RPM is 58, I'm sorry, red line is 5,800 RPM, max continuous is 5,500 RPM. So it'll be a little bit under 80, and, and there's some variabilities there as far as what does your induction look like and, and things like that. Um, but you would very typically be running the engine at, say, 70 horsepower consistently. Uh, the 100 horsepower engines, uh, they're again a pretty honest 100 horsepower. Uh, some of them are like 102, 103, uh, and again it depends upon your installation. For instance on the carbureted engines a lot of installations are, are cowled installations with a can and filters right on the carburetors and then you're pulling in air that's been warmed from being around the engine. So you're giving up three, four, five horsepower by doing that. On the other hand, in that kind of installation, we almost never see carburetor ice either. So, so there's some, some trade-offs and benefits to that. You can reach Lockwood Aviation. Uh, normal number is 863-655-5100. Uh, alternately, you can find us at uh, lockwood.aero. That's A-E-R-O, like aerodynamic. So just lockwood.aero. Um, if you're interested in the training, you can contact me. My email is dean at lockwood.arrow. Thanks for watching this week's episode on our Engine Week series. Return tomorrow to catch our next episode here on the Experimental Aircraft Channel. I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.